Hello, and welcome to Chaplin's Word of the Day. Today, the word I want us to consider is reconciliation, as seen in passages from the Psalms, Isaiah, and Ephesians. You know, sometimes even the nicest of people can become irritable. I'm reminded of a bad old joke about a group of monks who had taken a vow of silence. However, each year on a monk's birthday, he could say one sentence at breakfast time. When one monk's birthday came, he looked at his breakfast and said, I don't like oatmeal. When the next, month, uh, the next monk with a birthday got to say his sentence, he looked at the first monk and said, I like oatmeal. Finally, the third monk got to say a sentence on his birthday and looking at the other two said, I am tired of all this bickering over oatmeal. I said it was a bad joke, and it it is. Now, sadly, the state of relationships in our country today is no joke. Divisions exist between people of different cultures, genders, faiths, and generations. And even more sadly, uh, divisions and conflict also are common between people uh, who are of common cultures, genders, faiths, and generations. In observing news programs and various social media outlets, it seems as if no one agrees with anyone about anything at all, ever. As might be imagined, God has a different view, a different idea. Our God is not a God of dissension and confusion. Let me present just three passages of Scripture to support this assertion. First of all, in the Psalms, we see that God unifies. How very good and pleasant it is when the kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life evermore. Now, we all know that bad family relationships are often intractable and end badly, like the way that Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. But we also know that a harmonious family is one of the most nurturing and supporting relationships known to humanity. The psalmist describes the joy of living in such unified uh, relationships very vividly. We can't understand the full meaning of these similes today, but they obviously implied a joyous and intensely satisfying experience in the eyes of the author. Clearly, God wants people to live in unity as the family of humankind, supporting one another and loving Him, the one who provided us both temporal and eternal life. We also see in Isaiah that God gathers. Now, instead of excluding people, God gathers all people to Himself who seek His face and accept His sovereignty, as we see in Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 8. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be His servants, to all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my houses of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Now, the cultures of the Middle East have historically been known to be hospitable cultures. They have welcomed weary travelers from afar off and offered them food, shelter, and rest. Sojourners would find the sustenance they need to continue their journey from uh, from almost every household in the land. Isaiah, however, refers to a deeper, permanent reception on the part of God. Our God not only helps sojourners on their way, He actually wants them to stay and become part of His kingdom, His household, His family. He receives their worship, hears their prayers, and makes them a part of His people. He accepts them not as strangers to be fed and then sped away, but as integral parts of His gathered flock. He is not only hospitable to them, but He also allows them to belong. By its nature, ministry can be an itinerant calling. It is easy to become a cut flower without roots in the community where you reside and where you minister. This makes it all the more sweet when a church or community embraces a pastor and his family and makes them a true part of the fellowship and the fabric of local society. How this feels, I can uh, relate because I have experienced it and I know it is awesome. The thing is, our acceptance and embrace by God is so much more awesome. Words are inadequate to describe the wonder of that blessing. We also see in 
Ephesians that God reconciles. Instead of pushing people away, God reconciles them to Himself and to each other, as we see in Ephesians 3, 13 through 20. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and and the prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. Even a cursory examination of human behavior will reveal that people offend one another with their behavior. A cursory review of the Scriptures will also reveal that people also offend God with their behavior. Many have also been, have observed that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, about half of them teach us how to behave toward God, and the other half teaches us how to behave toward each other. So I think that fact reveals God's heart. It seems obvious that humans in the 21st century have become more, not less, judgmental. They have become more critical and less accepting of one another, and they often reject any attempts at reconciliation. If anyone has ever said, done, wrote, or thought anything that offends another, or if anyone has ever had an attitude, opinion, or political position which another disagrees with, that person is canceled. And not only are they dead to me as an attitude, but also what we find is they being merely is not dead enough. The offending person and anything that they love must be utterly and completely destroyed. Sadly, this tendency is not just found in secular culture, but it can be found in our churches as well. God, however, is a reconciling God. He sent His uniquely begotten Son to lay down His life to become a bridge between God and people and also to unite people in His reconciling love for us. Instead of utterly destroying us, God worked to repair the breach between Him and us and between each other as well. When someone repents and confesses their sin through Christ, God will forgive them as 1 John 1, 9 tells us, When we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the God of the universe is willing to forgive us, should we not also forgive those who uh, repent and confess their sins against us? Not only does God reconcile, He has given His people a ministry of reconciliation. Far from canceling one another, God wants us to enjoy the fruits of a ministry of bringing brothers and sisters together in harmony and peace. In conclusion, as fractious as our society and churches are today, I know that for a fact, people with ruptured relationships can be reconciled. Long ago, in a church far away from where I now live and serve, I worked with two church leaders who had developed a strong contention with each other. Now, as as their pastor, I was trying to help this congregation revitalize itself, and this situation had become disruptive, so that effort was inhibited. And besides that, I liked both of these men, and it saddened me to see them alienated. I'm glad to say that I was able to bring them together at a neutral site and gently speak to them about their need to reconcile with one another. It was a sweet time, and the Holy Spirit did make inroads into that relationship. They were never fast friends, but they were able to cooperate and be kind to one another, and it helped our efforts immensely. And it was a joy to be in fellowship with them. Would to God that our churches and our nation would seize this vision of reconciliation. Thanks for watching. I'll be back again soon with a Another word that we can consider together, every blessing, I'm Chaplain Otis Corbett.